When I talk about the Creative Vision Factory, I often ask people to imagine the high school art room ripped out of the school system and inserted into the streets of the city and open for anybody to come in and attend. Now the history of the Creative Vision Factory starts with a lawsuit. About six years ago, the US Department of Justice sued the Delaware Psychiatric Center for being out of compliance with the Americans with the Dis Disabilities Act and the Olmstead Act, which guarantees that you ought to be able to receive your services in the least segregated environment possible. And what was happening at the state hospital is people were warehoused there for periods of 10, 15, 20 years. And the reasons why were a lack of supports in the community to integrate folks back into the community. And so lucky, luckily for me, I found myself at the right place at the right time. Because a part of the reforms that came as a result of the settlement agreement were a whole nexus of programs spread throughout the state. One idea was that there could be a peer-run art center. This art center would be open for people on the behavioral health spectrum, people experiencing mental illness, people with lived experience of substance abuse past. And that the director of a place like this should also identify as a peer. And so my history really kind of came together here because I had an art background, but I also had this secret skill set. And the secret skill set is that I'm in recovery. And so my recovery story starts a long time ago. You know, in addition to my early childhood trauma, I feel like I had a lot of early childhood recovery. When I was seven years old, I was in the car with my mother when she had a DUI crash that forced her to seek treatment. Really quickly, I realized that my life went from the unpredictability and the chaos of my mother's addiction to the stability and the predictability of recovery. Now, if I could go back in time and grab anything from my childhood and bring it back to the future, bring it back to the now, it would be my mom's phone book. Now back in the day when you're on the telephone, you would like literally be attached to a wall with a cord. <laughs> and you could only go as far as that cord would allow you to go. And so early in my mother's recovery, she would often be in the kitchen on the phone. These conversations were never just pleasant, you know, conversation. It was always intense conversation. She was always fiercely advocating for her rights, her access to student loans, fighting off creditors, emotional conversations with my father to try to get child support. These other conversations, too, were helping other young mothers and other young women in recovery. I understood that when that phone rang, she needed to be on the other end. And as she's on the phone, she would doodle and draw on this phone book. And every year, this phone book would become the most amazing piece of art. And from that time period, I understood several things. That recovery meant to fiercely advocate for your own needs, to fiercely advocate for your friends, and that drawing kind of helped, too. This thing that she could do that would pass the time and kind of treat her underlying anxiety. And so for me, as my story progresses, you know, the high school art room continued to come up as a place that was a real sanctuary for me. When I grew up, when I was in a senior in high school, I was in that room every chance I could get. My senior year, I was in there for three periods a day. I loved being in there. I saw myself as a serious art student. I was preparing for, for uh, you know, a degree program in college. It was a place where I could see my friends. It's a place where I could be self-directed. It was a place where I could do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, and how I wanted to do it. And I was instantly hooked to that. Now, when I went off to college, this is where I earned my credentials for the peer director of a substance abuse and mental health program. Really quickly, my drug use went from something that was creative and social to something that was completely dark. It owned me. It governed me. My first senior year of college, I found myself at White Deer Run in Allenwood, Pennsylvania, addicted to heroin, smoking crack, all fueled by alcohol. 
And I thought, how did I get here? Drugs ruled my life. Now, unlike other young people though, when I was leaving White Deer Run, I kind of knew what recovery was about. I used to have these nightmares that I was at an AA picnic with my mother. <laughs> you know, for me, I knew what recovery meant. It wasn't the stigma. I knew what to do. I also had this secret skill set, being an artist. I could do things. I, could, I had an activity that could put my mind aside, that I could make things and forget about myself for a short period of time. Now, I've been in the right place at the right time numerous times in my, my early career. And just a little after a year, after celebrating my first year clean and sober, I landed a teaching job teaching high school art in a rural town in Virginia. That experience to me was amazing. It was as if I got to start back over. It was like I got to go back to the place and start over again like I never had that first drink or drug. When I saw students come into that art room, I could tell that they were okay today. I started to see things that I didn't see when I was the student in the art room. Being on the other side of the desk, I started to see kids that I could tell as soon as they walked through the threshold, they were okay. They felt okay. I had countless students who I had to kick out of the room and remind them, hey, you have to go to math class. Class is over. You have other things you need to do. But I had this body of students that I knew were using the space for other things. They were using the space as a sanctuary. It was a place to be okay. It was finally that place where you knew that it was okay to be a little different. It was that place where you got to do this thing that you just had a really hard time describing to others that you just had to do. It was okay to be a little weird, it was okay. And so, I took this with me. And I uh, came to Delaware and pursued my Master's of Fine Arts degree. And when I uh, graduated from the University of Delaware's MFA program, I got a job in Wilmington, Delaware at the Delaware College of Art and Design. And I was pr pursuing a career in arts and academia. But an opportunity came about. This opportunity to direct this peer-run art center was really amazing for me because I knew immediately what had to be done and how the art studio could serve this broader purpose of community integration. Early on, when I was under contract with the state of Delaware, I heard a, a Patricia Deegan give a talk about community integration. And she said, the community is not where Walmart is. The community is a nexus of relationships built off of reciprocity. And I understood that the art studio could serve this, this role of not only connection, but also this role of reintroducing people to a broader community. So we set about creating the art studio for the city of Wilmington. When people come to the Creative Vision Factory, they have three things that they immediately gravitate towards, three things that keep them coming back. The first and foremost is freedom. To have a zone, a place where you can go and be genuinely self-directed, a place where you can decide what you want to do, how you want to do it, and when you're going to do it, is pretty radical. And it can be really radical for people who are caught up in the criminal justice system, the behavioral health system, where everybody that's serving us is telling us where to be, what to do, how to do it. Every place we go is throwing more paperwork at us, more barriers. This freedom, I understood from my own high school art room that if I was left alone, that I would be able to do things, that I could really gain genuine self-direction, that that autonomy is something that I craved and it kept me coming back. The second thing people get is this human connection, friendships. The art room is a place to cut up. It's a place to, to talk to people. It's a place where you're gonna meet like-minded people. You're gonna share ideas. When I was a high school art te teacher, that art room was always a social space. It was a space to lighten up, loosen up, to actually have conversations and not get detention referrals for it. And so this connectivity, though, what's radical about an art space serving as a drop-in center for behavioral health is that we also have a really broad public of people who come through the space 
solely because it is an art studio. Very rarely do you have somebody going into a homeless shelter just to hang out. You know? In the community art center, though, we have young students, young artists, other professionals coming in, and new networks are established for our artists. They get to meet a broad cross-section of the community, many different people. These networks, these relationships lead to opportunities. They lead to exhibition opportunities, to friendships, to jobs. But it's also a place to be counted, to be seen, to be somebody. So that connectivity is really important. The third thing is money. You know, so at the Creative Vision Factory, we firmly believe that every creative individual has the opportunity to build a micro-economy around themselves. If you have a talent and you make something, this something can be brought to market. This something can be bought and sold. This something can get a little bit of money in your pocket. And so, we support our artists at the Creative Vision Factory through organizing exhibitions, helping them understand how to show their work, we're also developing some entrepreneurial things like the factory designs bullet case earrings. These earrings, we're taking bullet shells, transforming them into earrings, and selling them. Artists who learn how to make them are learning how to bring a product to market, how to sell it, but we're also transforming the symbol of violence into something that can create economic opportunity. In addition to those sales, we're also applying for grants, um, artwork sales, and then also getting into commissioned artworks through public murals. And so the freedom, the social connectivity, the economic opportunity, we believe, are the things that lead to greater agency. When you have those three things in your life, you can then start to see a role for yourself by the power that those three things bring back to you, that enable you to insert your skills to a broader community. And so agency is this thing of being able to say that you have control of your, over your environment. Now, when I'm coming out of rehab as a young person, I got to go right back to a college campus. I had the support of a family that knew a lot about addiction. I had a lot of good opportunities. I had a great environment. Oftentimes, the individuals that I work with and I serve are coming into communities that aren't as conducive to recovery. They're in households where open air drug sales are taking place every single day. As a young person in early recovery, I think that if I had to walk by somebody offering me drugs on a daily basis, that I would not have made it. Being in the safety and the network of a college campus, being attached to recovery, I was able to change those people, places, and things. So it's really important for us that we use this new agency to build a better environment around individuals in recovery. It's really important for us to introduce ourselves to this broader community as assets. We are creative assets. We have talent. We have skills. We can be tapped for the reshaping of our environment. We have skills. And we, too, need this city to work a lot better. And so the mural projects for us have been a way for us really to introduce ourselves to broader communities, really set up potential partnerships, and show that our skill sets matter, but also we get to engage in another relationship, a relationship with the client. And so we've done murals now for the Kalmar Nickel Foundation, for an electric company. We even did a mural project with the Wilmington Police Department where we did uh, you know, window coverings, covering up vacant first floor retail space. Now what was dynamic about this is that the police officer that we were working with didn't really know much about our program, and our members did not trust this guy whatsoever. <laughs> and so, through working together, we started to get to know one another. You know, Sergeant Stoddard got to know our members, we got to know him, we got to know his, his concerns, his needs. And I also got to learn a, an interesting thing, that the police call this type of activity 
environmental policing. All right? And so in the art world, we call this creative placemaking. And creative placemaking, though, can also be used for all kinds of strategic strategies. So if you have a corner of a park that lots of heroin is being sold out of, one traditional strategy is to pay a lot of overtime, pay a lot of police to police that area very heavily. Another strategy is to organize Shakespeare in the park in that park every single day for an entire summer. One is a lot cheaper than the other. One has a lot of other less side effects, I'd say. And so, through creative placemaking, we can change the cultures of certain environments. And so what I propose with the Creative Vision Factory and interventions like us is that we can creative placemake traditional behavioral health care, that we can creative placemake drop-in centers, and create a more conducive environment for us to work together and to creatively come up with solutions to all kinds of environmental and community-based problems. But it creates, and it, it, we really need a newfound agency. We need to be able to see that these individuals have a skill, can be put to work towards creating a more just and creative city of Wilmington. And so at the Creative Vision Factory, you know, our, first, our first room functions as this drop-in center. People can come in, get coffee, hang out. The second space, you move into the large like high school art room, the large studio space where any materials are out and available for anybody to use. And the third space becomes like the master studios. The guy that's behind me right now, Michael Solomon, he first came to the program looking for a place to receive his mail. He hadn't drawn since elementary school. He was just trying to figure out how to get his food stamps. And like we say in Alcoholics Anonymous a lot, if you keep going to a barber shop, you're going to get a haircut. If you keep coming to the Creative Vision Factory, you're going to make something. <laughs> Michael has now led and been the foreman of two large-scale mural projects, having just completed one for an alternative school on the east side of the city. He's been able to use these skills to radically reintroduce him to the public, not as that guy experiencing homelessness, not as that, as that guy who just is re-entering, but as that guy with a skill and with a passion for bettering the community. Thank you.